Hi, my name is Julie Jostin, and I'm the author of Light Light. Okay, so these are photographs um, taken by the first female photographer, Anna Atkins, and she's also the first person who illuminated a book entirely with photographs. So she collected um, algae off the coasts of Britain in the early 1850s and then um, laid them out on photosensitive paper so that the paper developed in sunlight and what remained on um, the undeveloped part was the plant. So when you pick the plant up you have the negative um, and the paper itself has turned this vibrant beautiful blue. And I got really interested in her work. Um, and it, so the work she illustrated is actually um, part of natural history. So it's collecting all of these plants off off the coast of Britain that are local to the area and, um, and m m providing a way for them to become available to readers or collectors without them having to collect them. So in the book there are also images um, that you would sort of stumble upon at the end of a section or a movement and I'm hoping that you turn the pages in a way like you would with an, a natural history collection but imbricated in that are all of the complications of isolating a specimen on a page um, also the strange beauty of the plant, you don't necessarily know what you're looking at. Um, so that's what they're doing there. I don't think Light Light contains a moral. I think it's an experiment. It's an experiment in thinking um, about how botany and plants themselves were catalysts for incredible and often unnoticed um, historical changes. So the, the historical changes were noticed, but plants' relations to them, I think, are often um, undermined or overlooked. Um, and then at the same time, it's an experiment in modes of thinking and perceiving and feeling. So if we take the idea of thinking with plants, um, attending to their time frames, to their um, relations to how environments operate, then th that's an experiment on kind of human plant, human environmental interactions. And I'm often interested in the ways in which um, the analogy between, say, humans and plants runs in two directions. So when people talk, say Darwin, about roots functioning like a brain, it's fun to think about how the brain it's, functions like roots, right? So, so I would say it's an experiment in thinking through history and with um, plant materials. Well, so it, they're absorbing and terrifying because they're so pressing and global warming is happening. Every, it affects everything and it happens, you know, slowly. And in the beginning, you don't notice it precisely because everything is changing, right? So, um, so I think, you know, this reading created a kind of... Um, need in me to think through these things and to work with the language that surrounds them. So in the book I'm really interested in scientific discourse from the 18th and 19th centuries and from um, contemporary scientific writing. Um, so that's one way. So language is influenced by that reading. Um, the imperative to um, attend to these phenomenon is another, uh, or phenomena. Um, 
And also, a lot of that writing is just rich and beautiful. Uh, so it's absorbing in its own right, formally, and then with the content. And then suddenly, once you're reading it and you're completely immersed in it and you're out in the world, um, you see all of these things constantly that you've been reading about and then writing about. and So an, an, a kind of writerly uh, ecology or environment forms with it. And one of the things that I was struck by in my reading and that I, I kind of think about all the time is that some of the plants that well, many plants are transplants, so you have no firm idea anymore where they come from, but some of the plants came um, on ships with Africans who had been kidnapped and were going to be enslaved and then um, were cultivated in slave gardens and then were, and, and had very rich um, African traditions associated with them and then would be um, transplanted to Europe, European pleasure gardens. Um, and so you suddenly start to see how <laughs> nature is, it moves, right? Um, and it, it gets overlaid with different languages and different uses. Um, and it, it's also very cultivated. I read, I'm very open in my reading, so I read all sorts of things. Um, everything from th histories of science and theories of science, like um, si philosophies of science, which I don't always follow in detail the science, but I'm very interested in um, tracing along with the writer movements of thought. Um, so s texts on scientific thinking I find really exciting. Um, the actual historical documents are thrilling. And then, you know, R Rachel Carson um, is an amazing writer. And you, a lot of poetry is nonfiction, right? So um, I like things that, that uh, are dealing with language and ideas and facts and questioning all of those things at the same time. Um, so opening them up and complicating them or saying, you know, we call this a fact, but how do we understand this fact that depending on its context and depending on um, how you understand the factual, how it then resonates or, or doesn't. The idea of repetition is important in the book. Things are constantly return, but they're never identical, right? Because things can't repeat identically. So as soon as you have the repetition, it's already a repetition that has altered, or it's a repetition with variation. And I like the syntactical ambiguity of light light, which could be um, an imperative. It could be, and with an imperative, it could also be a plea, it can be, um, as you're saying, an adjective and a noun, um, a verb and a noun. Um, There's so many categories of possibility, or I guess another way of saying that is there are so many possibilities and they all exist simultaneously in this short phrase that's just a repetition. Um, and so I'm excited by the energy that that creates. Um, and it's an energy that I think lives in the materials that I've been working with. Um, and those are often dark. <laughs> so I think that's also one of the strange things that if, you know, light, light does, it's not all light, <laughs> right? Wind. The wind is a tongue to watch or touch. In it, a post with a hole bored by a beetle and three holes fissured by drying. 
A violent trumpet vine extends a tendril, gentles into a hole, withdraws. Were the vine an animal, its motion would be instinct, the tendril's spire turning through ellipses of thought. Proof anticipates direction. It is noon repeatedly, sky repeatedly, it is wind repeatedly, the moon rising or setting in declensions of light. To infer an existence, thinking by analogy of fossilized plants, of how little of life is alive in the world, how in a little hole a tendril may keep its point for 20 hours, perhaps, or 36, then withdraw. We extend to accompany the plant. We sway in the hatchery, learn synchrony from the silkworm. Tenses forget to pass or pass imperceptibly. Silk moth above a mulberry tree, caterpillar on a leaf, white pupa bending moonlight. How fruit drops in a concordance. A wasp call, crawls from a caterpillar cocoon. Your eyes bend the light in your hands, a surface to trace with the eye, to trace the eye with. To grow by looking, little peering efforts unexpectedly given. Shadow of a hovering kestrel, purple-starred hepatica, a rough sea. I lick fog, taste evening, invite forgetfulness as a way to perceive you, to let hepatica become a sensation without thought, a purple sea spreading in sunlight. Here, I feel myself there, the other side of the sea. A kestrel shadow hovers on the sea's surface. Quanta of light move in waves over the sea, move the sea to the horizon. Purple is a horizon extending the sky. It seems not an earth sky. To think of attention as moving without trying to be moved to shadow, hepatica, sea, to purple or sky. Rain falls on the sea and forms a night field of circles glittering idly in moonlight, then dissolves into sea surface to give attention to what does not exist here, there. Ghost Species Henry David Thoreau would describe the seasons, listing the flowering times of wildflowers around Concord, Massachusetts, 1851 to 1858. It continues today, the data, the occasional field, the wildflowers declining. Temperatures warm and surviving species flower now about seven days earlier than they did in the mid-19th century. Species sensitive to temperature have been best able to survive, best able, perhaps, to maintain synchronicity with other plants, pollinators, and predators. The ghostliness of seasonal change, an orchid coming to flower overnight. Species unresponsive to temperature have decreased in abundance. Lapsing species become, for a moment, ghosts. Place faithful, they persist after the ending of their environments. Exiled in stillness, then, in a moment, slipping out of life. Wardian case, terrarium. As Thoreau was cataloging flowers, a British ship came riding from Shanghai, was a trough toward Calcutta, 1851. The ship's direction making crests from desire, carrying thousands of stolen seedlings. An empire on the principle of the terrarium. In an enclosed case, plants grow, fed only by light, watered only by moisture condensed from the heat of the day, and returned to the soil at night. The tea seedlings were packed in 16 Wardian cases, boxes with glass sides and tops. Later in the century, Darwin would write, light acts on the tissue of plants almost in the same manner as it does on the nervous system of an animal. It was an accident, Ward's discovery, to watch the chrysalis of a sphinx moth metamorphose. Ward covered it with a glass jar. The hills of Darjeeling turned to, turned green, then tended and pruned, turned empire, and beneath the chrysalis, common grass and a rare fern sprouted. Mm -hmm.